Next, I'd like to welcome Gaurav Khanna to the stage. Gaurav is a 14-year veteran of Cisco Systems, and he's going to give an exciting talk about future trends in technology. Good morning, everybody. Uh, uh, this is working? Okay. Thank you, Mark, for allowing me to present today at this wonderful uh, conference. So I want to talk a little bit today, and it's Saturday morning, so expect to hear a few questions from me. Some of you guys are in school, so should be used to it. Um, I want to talk about some buzzwords you might be hearing today when listen to the news or read the paper. Mobility, cloud, internet of everything. Um, what do all these mean? And I want to walk you through in the next 20 minutes or so um, some of the evolution of these technologies. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of history. Uh, 2007, Macworld Expo, San Francisco, not too far from here. Some of you are stuck coming from there. Um, question, why was this significant, the introduction of the iPhone? Anybody? Just shout it out. Come on. Why was this significant? It changed the world. Yes, there you go. A protege of Steve Jobs right there. Changed the world. Anybody else? Why was the device significant? There were smartphones. People used Blackberries. You could do apps on those. You could check email. Uh, the iPod was already out. You know, you could surf the web on smart devices. Why, why was this significant? Touch screens, okay. You're, you're getting there. Okay, so in the interest of time, let me tell you what I think was one of the most significant things about this. While all of these devices were around, Apple combined them into one. That's what Steve Jobs said. Are you guys getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is all one. But it made the consumption of the video, the applications, and everything that you used really compelling on a mobile platform. So it wasn't that, hey, you know, I'll surf the web on my phone, but it kind of stinks. Let me just go home and I'll get the real experience on my desktop. Or, you know, I'll just kind of kludge together a message really quickly on my Blackberry, but I'll be able to write a real email when I get home. That changed. And that was significant. Because what it did, now, you know, this is Apple, this is Steve Jobs. They'll tell you, like you mentioned, you know, change the world. In fact, what it did was serve as a catalyst. It served as a catalyst for an era that was already underway. And it just took it to another level. It really did change the game. Okay? And now, you know, not too long later, guys, this was only seven years ago, not too long later, we have really, truly entered what a lot of people are calling the post-PC era. And we have really become untethered. And, and this is really the critical thing. People are writing for the mobile platforms first, and maybe only for those platforms, instead of the desktop platforms. Okay? Because that is where the consumption is, that is where the growth is, that is where the people are. And it's not anymore that you read the New York Times website that's, you know, the website for the laptop or the computer, and it's squeezed down into the mobile phone. The New York Times has written an app where you can read the news, and that experience is a lot of times, for many people, better than reading it on a computer. Same thing with applications. Same thing with a lot of things. Mobile applications can just be just beautiful, some of them. And I'm sure a lot of you uh, use some of these, and they're actually, some of them are quite addictive. Okay, so we have become now, just a short years later after the mobile revolution started, we have now become untethered. Okay, another question. I can see, I'm guessing there's some math and engineering majors. Anybody know what this is? 10 to the power of 21? Shout it out. No, okay. This is a zettabyte. 
it is a billion terabytes. Okay? And so now the zettabyte era is upon us. So part of this mobile revolution led to this point. Now let me, let me just give you some context. So some of you may not be able to remember 1992. I think some of the parents in the back might. Um, so in 1992, when I was in college, there was about 100 gigabytes of traffic on the internet every day. That's about the size of my photo library on my computer. That was the amount of information across the entire internet in 1992. Okay? A short while later, we went from 100 gig a day to 100 gig per second, or excuse me, 1997, we went to about 100 gig per hour on the internet, and soon after that, 100 gig uh, per day. By 2018, we're getting to 50,000 gig per second on the internet, 5,000 times more than what we had just a generation ago. Okay? And here's the key point to take away. Most of this traffic is coming from mobile devices, not from your laptops and not from your desktops. And here's the key thing. The reason why a lot of this traffic is exploding is because most of it is video. That is becoming the default way we talk now, is over video. I remember a time, just during my time at Cisco, most of the conferences would be phone calls. We'd call each other. Um, and now, most of us, partly because we're a company that actually makes the stuff, we just, even just a phone call, hey, how are you doing? How did that meeting go? That's just a video call. Okay, and that's a wonderful thing, in my opinion. And it's a, it's a wonderful trend, and it can happen now in the mobile devices. And remember what I said, that mobile experience is no longer a compromise. The video on these devices, the touch screen, and the retina display, all of these things make it incredibly compelling. Okay, so we've become untethered, and that experience is actually pretty good. Okay, but it raises whole host of problems, right? That zettabyte is not a small number. Okay, so what's going on? So we untether the people, we go to an era of mobility, okay? What we now also have to do is all the stuff that's bringing us this video, all the stuff that's bringing us these apps that we use, that also has to become untethered, okay? If you want to update your Facebook status on, if you're in the South China Sea or in the South Pacific, wouldn't it be nice if some part of Facebook were nearby you so you could have that interaction and have it be fast? You know, it's, it's the experience you would get if you were updating your Facebook status around here. Okay? Untether the people. The next step is untether the applications. And that leads to a really key technology that's the foundation of a lot of things that's making all this stuff possible for us, and that's called virtualization. Now again, the iPhone didn't create this world. What it did was usher in and make these technologies that were already around that much more sig significant to the point where everybody had to start adopting this. And the first is virtualization. Now here's virtualization very simply, and I, and I promised I wouldn't go into too much detail uh, technically, but it was actually the concept is very simple, okay? Traditionally, you have a hardware on the left. You can see you have hardware, you have one operating system, and on the operating system, you run a few applications. Okay? Everything is tied together. You get a server, it comes with that operating system, and then you install the apps. But what if you could now partition that server or that computer so that you could run multiple operating systems? Okay? And those multiple operating systems run multiple applications. All of a sudden, hopefully you can see, you're making much better use of that thing on the right. That same hardware can now run multiple things. The, the guy on the left there, you could run things, but there was a lot of processing space that was idle. It, it wasn't really being used, and it was just sitting there at your home. You couldn't do anything about it. But now you can start to divvy things up. Okay, a great example is, I run this on my, uh, what you can see is um, a Macintosh operating system, and within it, uh, you're running Windows 8. Some would w question why you're running Windows when you got a Mac, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, but you can see that that's a perfect example of virtualization. Okay, you're running one operating system on a hardware. Okay, and by the way, you could run Ubuntu, you could run Linux, whatever you want. Okay, so virtualization is untethering the apps. But we can take it a step further. 
Okay, what if computer hardware, server hardware, it breaks? Okay, we're not perfect, we make things that break. So check out on the left what happens. You have some application or something that's mission critical in a company. It's running on a, it's running on a blade, on a server, that blade breaks, it has a hardware failure. What if you could just move that application to another blade? It's part of what virtualization allows you to do. Now, look at this thing here. ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Planning Application. This could be like an HR application, something that tracks attendance in a school, something that tracks workers and all of that stuff. All of a sudden, this runs out of capacity running out of space, what do we do? In the old days, we'd have to build a new server and it takes days and install the app and do all of that. What if we could just move this guy to another server where there's more capacity? This happens in seconds, not days. Okay, remember, all of you decide to go in the South Pacific for a vacation and you're all updating your Facebook status. Facebook has to somehow move that resource closer to you. That's how it happens, and I'll touch on that a little bit more in a minute. Okay, so virtualization is a very important story, and where a lot of these things reside, what I just showed you about these things moving around, is in places called data centers. Um, now, these are not usually pretty buildings that you see as you're driving up Highway 101. These are these brick buildings. They don't even have tags sometimes and hold away sometimes in places you've never heard of. Uh, but these are massive, massive facilities that host the stuff that's coming to you on your phone. And we actually passed a tipping point. A lot of data centers were set up that traditional way I showed in a picture before, where there was kind of servers and one application running on each server. Um, oops. Mo we, uh, a few years ago, we passed a tipping point where actually more data centers are starting to be virtualized, being able to move stuff around within the data center uh, then they are non-virtualized, and that is significant. Again, keep in mind why we're covering this, right? This is all to be able to deliver this wonderful mobile world to you. It had to happen in the background. All right, so we untether the people, we get mobility. We untether the applications, we get virtualization. What if we untethered the data center itself, these facilities? Okay, and the workloads that they do to get you that wonderful stuff. What if we untethered those? And that's what really the cloud is about. Okay, so when you hear about cloud and it's a cloud thing and your data's in the cloud and intercloud, that's what we're really talking about. We're untethering this facility that's bringing you this wonderful stuff. Okay, so you can see a little bit of the evolution here. We have the, the workload and then the virtualization and we have VDC here, this um, acronym stands for Virtualized Data Center. And the analogy I wanna use here is these, these, these providers, Amazon, Microsoft, Cisco, some of these providers are building these massive facilities. They're actually getting companies to come in as tenants. So you could be, your startup could be a tenant on this data center, but they have additional capacity. They're not gonna build a separate building for the next company, what they're gonna do is just add another apartment, and another company comes along and they become a tenant, okay? So this concept of tenancy in a data center is what's helping scale all of this, okay? And here are some examples of things that live in these virtualized data centers. Maybe you guys are familiar with some of these apps. In fact, we're using, uh, we're using three of them. I'm using three of them today, WebEx, Dropbox, I took a few pictures here, it automatically uploads to my Dropbox account, and Evernote is how I take notes for this uh, presentation, and it's, I did it at home, I got it on my phone, so, okay, and there are obviously thousands more. But these apps, this is where they live. All right, so just really quickly again, you'll hear things like public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud, you know, the, People love to confuse everybody and sound really smart. Really, it's all the same thing, essentially, that you're a tenant in this vast space. The cool thing about this is you can kind of move around. Remember, we're untethering everything. So you can move, you can have a private cloud in your own company, you can host all your stuff, you run out of space, you, your choices are, let me build a whole new data 
or wow, that's expensive. Hey, Amazon, you have room. Maybe I can host part of my cloud with you. And now moving parts of your data center around to these different clouds is what leads to this concept of intercloud. Okay, so I'm, you know, like I said, Amazon, Microsoft, Cisco, a bunch of different companies. This is a very new market. So they're basically setting up so you can host your own thing. You can host your own data center. You run out of room, come to us. And they make a lot of money. In fact, a lot of people took notice. Jeff Bezos, not too long ago, said their business, Amazon Web Services, which hosts tons and tons of startups in some of these apps, he actually thinks this business will be bigger than retail. I mean, that was a holy cow moment for a lot of people. I mean, we, we all know how big Amazon is retail. He thinks this is going to be bigger. Okay, we've untethered people, we've untethered the apps, now we've untethered the entire workload and the data center, the holy grail. Now we're going to connect the unconnected. And that's only possible because of this world that we're building, okay? And that is the concept of the internet of everything. Okay, it may not sound, when people mention it, they don't necessarily, it's related to all of this. Hopefully this is showing you this is all part of an evolution. Now, 99% of the things in the world are not connected to anything. Remember, all along we've been talking about moving these workloads and these data centers and this cloud and all of that. At the end of the day, it's still feeding this thing, right? It's still feeding stuff that we see on here. Don't mind the crack screen. I'm getting a new one soon. Um, so, but, but there are things around us that if they were connected could provide incredibly valuable information to make things happen. Uh, the best example are things like smart cities. You could have sensors in traffic lights that detect how many cars are coming and going and it can adjust the traffic accordingly, really helping kind of ease the traffic. Uh, Barcelona is a city that's a smart city. They have sensors everywhere for parking and for this and that and it has really helped in just the civic life. And, and just, the, you know, there are many examples of this but, but this, this is really the concept. You can asset tracking, you can do millions of things if you can now connect things that are unconnected. But that's 99% of the world. Okay? There is a massive, massive opportunity here. The thing that's going to happen, the reason why everything I mentioned is important, is because now if everything is connected, you need to be able to untether, all that untethering that was going on, that needs to happen even more. Because as now all of a sudden in Barcelona, there's tons of data coming from smart sensors. Well, we have to move the workload and the compute capacity to Barcelona, how do we do it? Well, do we build a massive building at a data center there or move workloads around? Or what if they need more? So the process and that world we have built for our mobile devices will be instrumental in making this happen, which is connecting the unconnected, the Internet of Things. Now, there's a lot of hype around Internet of Things uh, I'll be, or Internet of Everything. I'll be the first to admit it. But I actually believe this number, 14 trillion. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? This is the last point I'll make. 14 trillion. What does this represent? The dollar sign should give it away. The market size of everything. Anybody know how big the US economy is, GDP? 16, 17 trillion, wow, good. We are now in the process of creating an economy the size of the United States, the largest economy in the world by far with this. The opportunity with the internet of everything is this big. And here's the key point I want you to all leave with. This space is wide open for you. This is too big, just like no company dominates the US economy, just like no company dominates really any economy of this size. There's no company that's going to dominate this. Or if there is, that, that, that company hasn't showed up yet. There are tons of small companies, wonderful startups out there that are rushing into this space. And this is bigger than the internet is. Because 99% of the stuff out there is not connected. So if you're all looking for something to do, I got something for you. Thank you very much.